National Broadcasting Company invites you by transcription to join the chase. There is always the hunter and the hunted, the pursuer and the pursued. It may be the voice of authority, or a race with death and destruction, the most relentless of the hunters. There are times when laughter is heard as counterpoint, and moments when sheer terror is the theme. But always there is the chase. As an associate professor of psychology at the I'm not considered to be a frivolous person. As a matter of fact, my students refer to me as Mr. Practical. For my entire life, in and out of the classroom has been precisely that. I'm 39 years of age, married, no children, don't drink or smoke, and in general leads an extremely placid existence. All of which cannot account for the fact that I have just undergone an experience so horrifying and revolting that it has aged me 20 years in mind, in body, and in soul. It started on a winter afternoon, right after I'd finished a lecture to my class on the so-called split personality aspects of schizophrenia, a mental ailment that can often have bizarre manifestations. And so we have what we call a split personality. Two sets of desires, emotions, characteristics in one person. And they are constantly in conflict with one another. A perennial chase, as it were, as to which shall be the dominating force. At... Well, I see that our time's up, ladies and gentlemen. You are dismissed. <laughs> Uh, yes, Miss Reen? Uh, your wife just telephoned, sir. She said she'd meet you here in your lecture hall in half an hour. You've got to have dinner out tonight. Oh, half an hour. Well, I suppose I can pass the time by checking over tomorrow's lecture. Thank you, Miss Reen. You're welcome, Professor. <sighs> Let me see. I sat down at my desk and began to sort my notes for the following lecture. The subject we were dealing with at the moment was an interesting one to me, and I was always certain that at this particular period I'd have no sleeping students on my hands. The split personality, the idea of one man's character and habits actually changing continually within his own mind, like a modern Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde was a fascinating topic long before the science of psychiatry named it for what it was. And my students were all ears whenever I broached the subject. I must have been working for over an hour in the warm, drowsy confines of the room when Miss Reed appeared again with another message who could be as irritating as the next one when she decided to be. Professor Calvin? Uh, yes, Miss Reed? Your wife just called again, sir. She said she's decided to cook dinner after all, and she wants you to go home. Oh, very well. Thank you. I'd better leave directly before she changes her mind once more. Oh. Nancy's sudden shifts of mind and plans were always irritating. But for some reason, they were especially aggravating on that particular evening. I suppose that accounts for the ridiculous whim I had to keep her waiting. For I decided to forego my usual bus ride and walk instead. As I strolled along the crowded avenue, I'd stop occasionally and glance into the lighted shop windows. Particularly the jewelry stores with their expensive baubles, which I've never wanted, much less could afford. Neat, huh? Mm -hmm. I beg your pardon. The stuff in the window, slick. Do you think so? Sure. So do you. Uh, how do you know what I think? I know you like a book, mister. Like a regular book. Them diamond cufflinks now, you'd look pretty swell dolled up in those. And the wristwatch in the corner with the emerald numbers. Neat. I'm glad they please you. Just a minute, mister. What is it you want? Come off your horse. The life is better down here in the gutter where I am. 
Unbend, Miss Why? Relax, you like. How it. dare you to talk to me like that? Get out of my way, you, you ruffian, before I call the police. As he stepped to one side, I walked quickly up the street. I couldn't resist the guy behind me as I reached the corner. He was still standing by the lighted shop window, a hard-looking, unshaved character with a battered face and ragged clothes. And as he saw me turn, he started slowly in my direction. For a moment, I had an undignified impulse to run like a rabbit. But I controlled myself and walked directly north to a spot where I knew a traffic policeman had his post. From time to time, I glanced around and saw my pursuer moving faster with quick, impatient steps, as if anxious to overtake me, but unwilling to As I neared the policeman's post, I had a moment of panic, because I thought at first he wouldn't be there. And then we suddenly ran into each other head-on as he turned the corner. What? What? Oh, officer. Oh, Tick, it is easy, Nesty. There's a man back there, a thug. He's been chasing me. That's where? Right behind me. He was only 10 or 15 yards away when I... What? Well, I don't see any man, Nesty. Why? Neither do I. I... Well, I'm sorry to trouble you, officer. He must have walked the other way. I suppose my behavior was idiotic under the circumstances. And I felt rather sheepish after my pursuer had disappeared. He may have only wanted to beg a quarter from me. And I actually had little to fear in a crowded avenue in the central part of town. These were my thoughts as I made my way home again. And the shops and apartment houses slowly gave way to the more remote suburban dwellings in the modest section Nancy and I had chosen for our own. But as I neared my house, I noticed a solitary figure leaning against a lamppost. And I knew immediately exactly who it was. What are you doing here? What took you so long, mister? I've been waiting for hours. I suggest you move on your way before I call a policeman. You can't do that, mister. I'm your friend. My what? We're buddies, ain't we? Give me a cigarette. I don't have any cigarettes, and what's more, I don't smoke. You ought to try it sometime. Here, have one of mine. What do you want with me? Nothing. Then why have you followed me home? Because I want to get to know you better. We have nothing in common. You'd be surprised. What are you grinning at? I'm looking at your clothes. What's the matter with my clothes? They're corny, mister. They date back to 1892. Why don't you wise up to yourself and get some snappy duds? Oh, like yours, for instance. At least mine fit my personality. Yes. You've got a personality like a barnyard hog. You better go inside, mister. Your wife is waiting for you. Now, look here. I'm telling you once and for all, I won't tolerate being followed. You'll either leave me alone or I'll swear out a warrant for your arrest, and that's final. See you later, mister. And you'll also see... He was gone. When I turned, he was gone. I left him standing near my gate as I hurried up the walk. And only three seconds later, he wasn't there. George! Uh, yes, Nancy. Why are you standing there alone in the cold? I, I wasn't alone. Nothing, Nancy. I'll be right in. Now, let me say right here that if you think my stubborn follower was a ghost, get it out of your mind immediately. Not that I believe in phantoms. I'm much too practical a man. But in such illusions, I doubt if they'd smoke cigarettes or smell like Bowery sliders. No, my man was real, at least to me. But what he wanted and why he was after me was something else again. George. Yeah. Uh, yes, Nancy? What's the matter with you? With me? You haven't even touched your dinner. Are you ill, dear? No. No, I'm not ill. 
What did... Did something go wrong in class today? No, everything's fine. Then what is the trouble, George? Nothing, Nancy, nothing at all. Why are you sulking like that? I'm not sulking. I'm merely deep in thought. About what? Various things. Well, can't you think and eat at the same time? I'm afraid I'm not very hungry, dear. George Calvin, I spent half the day shopping for this meal and the other half cooking it. You have no idea how high asparagus is this time of year. Yet I managed to buy some because I know how much you like it. Now, George, If you'll really excuse I... me, Nancy, I'm going for a walk. There's nothing wrong with Nancy except the fact that her mind functions in minute circles that only center around such things as asparagus and ripe tomatoes. She has very little wit, less imagination, and I knew if I discussed my problem with her, I'd end up nowhere. So I took to the street again, walking south toward the river and the warehouse district. Don't ask me why I walked in that direction or why I wasn't afraid. But I suddenly grew bolder. For I'd made up my mind to get to the bottom of this curious situation just as soon as it arose once more. I didn't have long to wait, moreover, before my uninvited bloodhound made his third appearance. Walking, Professor? Yes. I thought I'd get some air. Mind if I walk along with you? You'd only follow me if I object. I've got a proposition I want to make to you, Professor. I think it's one you like. What kind of a proposition? Not here on the street. Let's find a cozy little corner where we can talk. All right. Suggest one. See that bar and grill across the street? What about it? Charlie's joint. He's got the best beer and booze in town. If you think I'm going to be seen inside a broken-down meeting place for drunks and tramps... Come off it, Professor. You know you always wanted to go in and see what it was like. What? How did you know that? <sighs> True, ain't it? No. All right. No. But you'll meet me there anyway. Meet you there? Order me a boiler maker and buy one for yourself. Double boiler maker, Professor. For me and my pal. There was a mist blowing up from the river as he backed away from me. And a patch of fog suddenly enveloped him like a shroud and he faded into the mist. And like an automaton run by remote control, I found myself walking across the street and into Charlie's bar and grill. Uh, what's your pleasure, chump? My, my pleasure? And uh, what do you have? A boilermaker. Boilermaker? Yes, a boilermaker. Two of them. The second one's for my friend. Just put them on the counter, barkeep, side by side. The place was empty except for one lone seaman who finished his beer a moment later and sauntered out. The barkeep poured three fingers of whiskey and two glasses, then set them side by side with two beers in the edge of the bar. He looked me over for a moment, as if trying to make up his mind to say something, while I stood with my eyes glued to the whiskey wondering what on earth I was doing there at all. Uh, you, uh, you've never been in here before, mister. I know I haven't. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, uh, maybe, uh, maybe you, uh, ought to be home in bed. Now, what do you mean by that remark? Uh, no offense, mister, no offense, it's just that you look a little tired and, uh, sick, maybe. Are you here to serve drinks? Or give your customers the dubious benefit of your philosophy. Uh, I'm here, here to serve, Mr. Suit yourself. That's telling them, Professor. How did you get in here? I walked in the way you did. Here's mud in your eyes. Wait a minute. We came here to talk, not to drink. You said you had a proposition for me. And I have, Professor. How do you know that I'm a professor? <laughs> I know you like a book. There's something weird about you, something unholy. Why do you keep disappearing like, like some kind of a wraith? 
You're no ghost. Why do you act like one? You know how real I am, Professor. You know I'm not a ghost. Feel my oh. arm if you... I, I don't want to touch you. Get away from me. I, I don't want any part of you, you filthy tramp. Hey, hey, what goes, mister? Throw him out. Throw him out of here. Tell him to leave me alone. Tell, uh, tell who to leave you alone, mister? Tell who? What? Look, you better be on your way, chum, huh? The air will soap you up. It was true. I buried my face in my hands. When I raised my eyes and the barkeep hurried up, the tramp was gone. But his glass... The one that was standing in the bar in front of him was empty. My mind was still full. Is that you, George? Yes, yes, Nancy, it's me. Oh, just a minute. Oh, you're getting your bandrow. Oh. Now, where on earth have you been? I, I took a walk, as I said I would. Until 2 o'clock in the morning? It's 2 o'clock? Yes. I've been worried sick about you. I, I'm sorry, Nancy. I should think you would be sorry. George, what's the matter with you? You've never behaved this way before. What's gotten into you? I'm beginning to wonder myself. Who have you been seeing, George? Who have I been seeing? How, how do you know I've been seeing someone? Because he called. He called? On the telephone? You know who I mean? No, no. Well, you tell me, Nancy. Who, who was it that called? Well, he, he wouldn't leave his name, but language. I've never been so shocked and disgusted in my life. He sounded like, like a gutter snipe. He said he knew you intimately. Oh. Where in heaven did a man like that? Oh, then he is real. Oh, thank goodness for that much. What do you mean, he is real? What are you talking it, about? Tell me when he called and what he said, Nancy. It's very important. Well, half of what he said was unintelligible, but he... He certainly felt he could twist you around his little finger. I, you see, I think he called about 11. Uh, just after he left me on the street when I went into the bar. What bar? Well, it, it isn't important. George! Have you been drinking? Uh, don't be silly. I, I was in a bar, but I didn't touch my drink. He downed his, though, like the tramp he was. <laughs> well, I can forgive him anything now. At least I'm all right. And what do you mean, at least you're all right? Well, I thought for a while that... Oh, let's not talk about it anymore. Late, Nancy, I've kept you up long enough. Well, you're aware of that much. I'm sorry, dear. Here, a kiss goodnight. George. What? You lied to me. You lied. You said you hadn't been drinking, and you have. What do you mean? I can smell the cheap whiskey on your breath. No, Nancy. Oh, George. Say you're joking. If you love me, Nancy, say you've only well, been joking. Oh, George, it isn't as bad as all that. <laughs> One little drink. Well, well, you look as if... But you... don't you see? I've never taken a drink in my life, Nancy. And I swear, I don't remember to... Tonight. I had to find out the truth once and for all. Now that I realize there could still be a chance that... Go to bed, Nancy. I'm going out. You're what? I'm going out, I said. But it's after two. I don't know what time it is. Stop arguing with me and go to bed. George, what's wrong with you? Nothing. But you've never talked to me like that before. Now listen, Nancy. Please do not worry. I'll be back shortly. I promise you. But but this is important. And and one thing more. You mustn't forget this, Nancy. For heaven's sake, please keep it on your mind. Mustn't forget what, George? Don't open that door to anyone but me. Even if somebody says it's me, be, be sure you hear my voice. But I, I, I don't understand. Don't try. Just do as I say, please. Here. here. Here's my key. I'll leave without one, so I can't get in unless you open that door yourself. George. What? Please tell me what this is all about. I'm terribly worried about you. I'm... I'm not so sure I know myself, Nancy. But I intend to find out. Right now. headed for the waterfront in Charlie's bar. I knew he'd follow me again, tag my footsteps like a shadow. But I walked for several blocks. Nothing happened. Then suddenly, I sensed he was behind me. I didn't have to look. I just... And without stopping for an instant, I passed the bolted barroom door and headed for the wharf. When I reached the wharf, I hesitated. Then leaned against the stanchion and waited. 
until I felt him near me. Here again? Here again, Professor. I... I guess there's no eluding you. No. Give me one of your cigarettes. Pleasure, Professor. How's about a drink, too? Charlie's bar is closed. I got the fixings right here. Okay. Here's looking at you. Not bad. Don't think you're fooling anyone. I know exactly who you are. Yeah? Who? You're me. <laughs> That's right, Professor. You're actually a delusion. I've gone insane, and you're my second self, my alter ego, so to speak. The other half of my split personality. I don't get all that fancy lingo, but it's okay if you say so. You actually don't exist. And if I try hard enough, I may be able to erase you completely. All right. Try. What, what do you want? I want to make you my proposition. Then make it and be quick about it. Take it easy, Professor. I'm calling the shots from now on. What do you want? I want to make you over, mister. I want to fix it so you do what you want to do. Go where you want to go and live like you always wanted to live. I'm that way now. <laughs> what are you laughing at? You, you chump. Look at you. You're not a man. You're a hunk of cabbage. You hate your work. You hate your way of living. And most of all, you hate your wife. That's a lie. Don't hand me that, Professor. I'm one guy you can't kid, remember? Why, why don't you go away and leave me alone? Because we're going to do business together. No! Yeah, you'll listen and you'll like it. Go on. Talk. Your wife's got money, Professor. What money? The 30 grand her grandpa left her five years ago. That, that, that money's in trust. It can't be touched. She's also got 20 grand in life insurance. What about it? 50 grand. That's a lot of cash. But and when you figure you don't like her anyway. What are you driving at? It'll be an easier cinch. You open the window and push her out. <sighs> It'll look like an accident. Remember that spiked railing you put around the garden right underneath your bedroom if somebody fell on it. Shut that. your mouth! Shut up! Do you hear? I was just suggesting... I won't listen to any more of your rotten talk. Don't go yet. Wait. It ain't only the money. What? You're doing it for something else. I... I am? All your life you lived like a jerk, Professor. You know you never had any fun. This dough can get you one big fling. <laughs> Wine, women, and song, Professor. All the booze you can handle. And every cutie in town dying to put their arms around you. How's the picture, Professor? Get, get away from me. What's the matter? Going chicken on me? How many times did I hear you wish for a different way of living? How many times did you watch the next guy having his fun while you sat around like a plaster idol afraid to make a move because of your reputation? How many times, Professor, have you wished for a chance like that? Never. Never. In a pig's eye, never. All right, listen. Maybe you don't like the iron railing idea. I got another gimmick. Remember the gun you bought that time you heard there were prowlers in the neighborhood? Be quiet, I tell you. It's still in the desk drawer where you left it. If you shot her, you can say you made a mistake. You can say you thought she was a burglar in the dark. It's happened like that before, and nobody will suspect the story's a phony. After all, why should they suspect you, the hard-working professor who never made a funny move in all his life? And everybody knows how much you love your wife. If, if you don't get away from here, I'll... I'll... You'll watch. You ain't got guts enough to spit hard. Get away from me! Get away! I struck out with my fist with all my strength, but there was nothing. Nothing. I started to run like a lungs were burning and I choked for air. And then, then I was home again, in front of my door. Who is it? It's, it's George, Nancy. Oh, George. Nancy, 
That's it. I have something to tell you. Well, what's happened, George? You're, you're off the fire, not a breath. I've been running. From who? From myself. George, what are you saying? Nancy, don't argue with me. Call the police. But why? I can't explain. It's too involved. It's that, that phone call before. It was I who called you, Nancy. You? My other self. The other me. Don't you see, Nancy? I, I, I'm ill. I, I'm two different people. I, I need help. Oh, George, darling. I... Nancy, call the police. Wait, wait. George, what is it? It's too late for the police. Put down the phone. Now, quickly. Go to the desk drawer. Yes, that's right. Take out the gun you'll find there. Now. Shoot me. Why? Shoot me, Nancy. Before it's too late. Before... It's too late. Yeah, it's too late. Come on, baby. Come on, like a good little girl. Give me the gun. Keep away from me. Hand it over, baby. Listen, forget George. Hand it over before I... <laughs> Miss Reed. <laughs> I'm sure. What'd you think it was? Oh. Well, well, I'm still here in my lecture room. I didn't leave school at all. You fell asleep while you were working on your paper. Well, uh, your wife's outside. Nancy? Uh-huh. She's waiting for you. Oh, Nancy, waiting for me. <laughs> tell her I'll be right out. <laughs> yes, tell her, Miss Reed. Tell her. That's all there was to it. One minor item. A few minutes later, Nancy and I were walking up the street together, and I was just about to tell her of my dream when she stopped at a jewelry window to admire the display. Aren't those cufflinks beautiful, George? <laughs> I wish I could afford to buy you a pair just like them. They're, they're very nice. Neat, huh? Nancy. I beg your pardon? The stuff in the window. Slick. Nancy. Do, do you see him? Of course I see him. He's got a nerve breaking into our conversation Well, that's all like I that. want to know. Come on. Oh, George. George. <laughs> George. In the animal world, there is the hunter and the hunted. Hound and fox. Hawk and sparrow, chicken and... But who is to judge precisely which is the pursuer or the pursued as we enter the chase? The chase was created and written for the National Broadcasting Company by Lawrence Clee. Featured in tonight's cast were Nelson Olmsted, Ann Petoniak, Ken Lynch, and Larry Haynes. Chase is directed and transcribed by Fred Way. Fred Collins speaking. Next week, the exciting story of a killer at large and a statewide pursuit in The Chase.